wonder how many of you have taken s some or a whole class or part of a class in bioma. Could I see your hand and lift them up there? So we've got a few bioma people here tonight. Would somebody um, like to just briefly get up and give um, a testimony of what uh, Bioma has done for you. Is there somebody like that tonight? Yes, sir. It just really, it just, it's helped me to dig deeper and to, to you know, to just to not read just the surface of the scripture, to break it down. Uh, you know, you, you've helped taught me to break it down. To the yes, ma'am. Uh, to just mention, and I'll give my testimony I am as a result of Bible Institute. Um, in the United States in the 1900s, a re something really interesting happened, came out of the D.L. Moody meetings. And that was that people wanted to know more about their Bible. They got saved. Um, they, uh, they understood, but, but they needed to know more about the Bible. And Bible college was simply not in the offing for many people. They, they didn't have the money or the time to go to Bible college. And so God left, laid on the heart of a man by the name of Dwight L. Moody to start a Bible Institute, Moody Bible Institute. It was to be designed to be a practical, oftentimes three-year approach to the Bible where you learn not um, simply just theory, but stuff that goes on the, the everyday in your life. And that you, can, uh, you didn't just learn about the Bible, you learned the Bible. Now, um, the man who led me to the Lord graduated from Practical Bible uh, Institute, which at that time was in Philadelphia, it is today known as Philadelphia College of the Bible. Um, the man who really brought me along spiritually, Brother Ray Childers, was president of Southland Bible Institute where our brother Bill Ice had graduated from. And so I have a background in, in Bible Institute. Um, and I've seen this, this is what is used when uh, you have missionaries going out to the field and um, they want to teach young men and young women to serve the Lord. It is not, um, it is not pie in the sky. It is not um, trying to shovel it down from off the, the ceiling, but it rather is um, let's, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf where all the little kids can get to them. That's what a Bible Institute is all about. It places in the hands of people the opportunity to learn to open the Bible for themselves and to become self-sufficient and to pass that self-sufficiency on to other people. Our text tonight, if you would like to turn in your Bible, is 2 Timothy, and I'm going to read uh, the passage that's up on the board here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7. Thou therefore, my son, this is Timothy, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, tonight, as we take some time to look at our responsibilities, 
I pray that you would cause us to realize the great privilege we have having been raised in this country. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to realize that in these days of challenge for the church, it is not the responsibility of some Bible college, it is not the responsibility of some great university, it is the responsibility of the local church to teach and to foster and to pass on to the next generation all that um, God has for us. And that, Lord, if we don't pass it on, that when it comes to Eben's generation, uh, when it comes to uh, Shar and um, uh, and uh, Joni and uh, the other young people in our church, Lord, if, if we don't pass it on, there won't be Bible truth for these young people coming up. And so help us not to drop the ball, but to take responsibility, to make ourselves excellent for the cause of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. I want to call your attention to some words in this um, passage of Scripture that talk about our challenge. You see these men, these are Navy SEALs. And these Navy SEALs, as part of their training, have to lie on a beach. And they have placed on them a telephone pole. And it is their responsibility working together before the tide comes in to remove that telephone pole by their efforts together and to rescue every single man. They are placed in a place of peril. And it's part of their training. That oft times they will take and bind the hands of the, the Navy SEAL recruit and push him into the water. And uh, he is to free himself underwater and at the same time also rescue his fellows. Um, why? Because our government realizes, our military realizes that out in the real world, out in, in the battlefield, you're not go nobody is going to look and say, hey, where did you go to college? They're not going to say, hey, um, uh, how many letters do you have after your name? They're going to know that there are people out there in the field who learn how to work together, who learn how to accomplish things, and how to do things with excellence. This is why our military has no higher designation for any uh, of its men as, as to be a Navy SEAL. And these men and the SEALs learn how to endure hardness. Notice the challenge that Paul gives young Timothy here. Notice these words I have in bold. Be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Endure hardness as a good soldier. Don't entangle yourself with the affairs of this life. You've been chosen to be a soldier. Strive for mastery. That is uh, what these Olympic athletes are trying to do is to prepare themselves to go for the gold, so to speak. And then the Bible says the husband laboreth also. Um, uh, this is the person who is uh, out there working every day in the field. And if you don't believe farming is hard work, you've never worked on a real farm. All of these tell us that the Christian life is not a uh, picnic. It is not a uh, opportunity to simply socialize or hobnob, but we were called, we were saved to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we, are not, we do not work for our salvation. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But in that very same passage, Paul says, we were created unto good works, for which we are foreordained. And it is our responsibility, church, it is our responsibility. And tonight, you are the core people of this church. 
And I will say this to you today, if we do not take responsibility to become the best we can be for the Lord Jesus Christ, if we don't strive for excellence in our understanding of the Bible, who will? It won't be the people who come here and only inhabit these pews on Sunday morning. It won't be the people who drop their kids off and, and drive off. It won't be the people who occasionally flip a dollar in the offering plate and feel that they have done a responsibility. The call to prepare to serve the Lord is for those who are willing to give their all for Jesus Christ. And that ought to be every single person in this room. There is no person in this room who could not be used of God to win some soul to Jesus Christ. There is no person in this room that could not be good at visiting the shut-ins. There is no person in this room that could not start a ministry of street preaching. There is nobody in this church that could not have the opportunity to teach a Sunday school class or to work with young people. My friends, the world is dying for a want of people who will take responsibility. And it is our challenge, dear friends, it is those of us who are willing to step up to the plate and say, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. And to know that we are the children of God, it is our responsibility to train ourselves and to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and in our lives to make us what we should be for God. We should be show window material. Now you say, why do we need to do this, Brother Kevin? Well, I want to suggest to you that we live in perilous times. Listen to some of the things that I have uh, found out in the last few months and weeks as I've been studying for this. We are facing a number of things that are more difficult than um, the church has ever faced before in this modern time. In fact, I told Brother Wolf this morning, I believe we are not in the post-Christian era. I hear people say all the time, we're in the post-Christian era. No, we're in the pre-Christian era. We've gone back to what it was like prior to the uh, church going out into the world to reach the world for the gospel of Christ. We have been so dilatory in, in what God has called us to do that we have failed to carry out the Great Commission. There are a number of things that I would just mention. I want to mention these quickly because I want to move on here, but notice several of our educational organizations have undermined the faith of several generations. Our kids today, your kids, your grandkids, your nephews, your nieces, your grandnieces or grandnephews or your children to be are being taught today. There are no absolutes. There's nothing absolutely wrong and nothing absolutely right. And young people are being placed in a situation where they're told there are no rules. And because there are no rules, they have no foundation under their feet. They're being told that there is no meaning or purpose to life. The root thought behind evolution is this, friends, that there is no purpose, no meaning to life. It's all an accident. It just happened. Um, and, and as a result of that, there's no such thing as human dignity. Evolution simply teaches everybody. The Big Bang simply teaches everybody. We're here by accident and we have no purpose. If you take the foundation out from a young person, if you take anything to hold out from on a young person, then their whole world begins to collapse and that's why they're killing themselves by the hundreds and thousands. We, we are being told our educational system has failed. They're wrong. It has 
accomplished exactly what the devil wanted it to do. There is no foundation for these kids. And we must, church, listen to me today, we must fight. We must stand up and we must say to the world, there are absolutes, there are rules, and we are here for a purpose, and you were created in the image of God, therefore you have dignity and worth. The world is said to be in the post-Christian era, but we have actually returned to a pre-Christian paganism. And paganism was, uh, was characterized by three things. First of all, immorality. Everybody did what they wanted to, whatever felt good. And so today, people will do whatever they want to do and however, whatever feels good. Hedonism. That means that they live for pleasure. And uh, we can see the shattered results of that as the home and family falls apart and narcissism, it's all about me. Now that's where we are today in our culture and that is exactly the opposite of biblical Christianity. How are we going to be able to combat those ideals unless we are saturated and steeped in the word of God? The rise of Eastern mysticism has uh, taken our country by storm. Everybody from Oprah to Chopra have come out today uh, pushing this whole idea of meditation and, and yoga and all of this kind of thing, and the church has been silent. Occult practices have now become mainstream. You will all the time uh, see on TV that the use of psychics and all kinds of other things, it's become almost accepted in our culture today that the occult is as, as uh, open and as willing to be received by the world today as the truth of God. There's the rise of militant atheism, which is trying to tear down the faith of many. And by the way, their arguments are as weak as they've always been, but we have stepped to one side and let the world win this argument. There's the failure and apostasy of the mainline denominations, the rise of textual criticism. Look here today, friends, let me say this. We don't set in judgment on the Bible. The Bible sets in judgment on us. And this whole idea that we can throw this part of the Bible out because we don't like it or that part of the Bible out because we don't like it. And my friends, let me tell you, many of the versions today, you'll find whole passages of Scripture completely exiled and on the basis of a very faulty theory which says that um, the so-called oldest manuscripts are the best and I can destroy that argument very quickly my Bible if you are to go to my house and you are to look at my old Bibles you'll find that I've got old Bibles in my house that are practically falling apart you can't even read many of them anymore and the reason for that is these Bibles got used in the days before there was the efficient copying of scripture. They would copy the scripture by hand and if they made a mistake on something, they would put it up on the shelf and not use it. And we find a lot of these so-called older manuscripts that are in existence today that had been put up on the shelf because there was a mistake in these things. And they didn't want to use them because of the fact that there was an error in them. The, the Bible as we have it today, um, and, and I support it, uh, we're not, I am not a Ruckmanite, but I will tell you this, I believe very strongly in the King James Bible. And the reason I believe in the King James Bible is that it is based on the right manuscript group of the Word of God. And my friends, this is the Bible that God has used for Spurgeon and Wesley and uh, for, um, uh, for the Moody and the great man of the past. And this is the Bible that God has put his stamp on for the English-speaking people. And I want to say this to you today. There's not a thing in this Bible that you cannot put your faith in. 
There's the denial of basic orthodoxy that is going on in the church today. The deity of Christ is ridiculed. The trinity of God is downplayed. The atonement is laughed at. Sin, salvation, hell, and heaven are all spiritualized or taken out. My friends, we are living in an age of crisis, and that has led to some very shocking statistics and some very shocking things that have gone on. Did you know that less than 20% of the church regularly attend, or 20% of Americans regularly attend church? Now, if you look at polls, they will tell you it's more like 40%, but people lie to pollsters, and pastors will tell you the truth. Only about 20% of Americans are regularly attending church. The average American church uh, attendance is steadily declining. Do you know that mid-sized churches are almost a thing of the past? The dog and pony show churches that have the big flashing lights and the, um, the, the, uh, the wild, uh, strange uh, programs and things like that, the, the smoke and mirror crowd, they're able to get a huge crowd of people who are about an inch deep and a mile wide. But my friends, the small churches are the ones that are really growing today. And they're growing because there are people who are wanting, some people are wanting to get the word of God. And it is the small churches that are preaching expository messages today. Do you realize that the increase in churches is only a fourth of what we need to keep up with our population growth so that by the time in 2050, the percentage of the U.S. population attending church will be almost half of what it was in 1990. That's about 11.7%. That means that out of every 10 people, there's going to be uh, about one who is going to be going to church. And that every year, somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 churches will close their doors in the United States. And those churches are not being replaced. This is what's going on today. And look, there are a lot of challenges for the church in this. First of all, um, there are many young people coming out of our churches who are saying, we no longer believe the stories of the Bible. In a recent survey that was made, almost 39% said we started doubting the Bible in junior high. We need to be working with our junior high kids right now. Right now. To, to, uh, and and that, look, that's not a flannel graph thing. That, that's not uh, simply going through a, a lesson book. That means we have to get into the Word and indoctrinate and teach these kids so that as they grow up, they will not depart from the Bible. Um, something interesting that I read in one study, it said, look around in your church and imagine every person in the church as being a teenager. Let's just, just look around you and just, I just made you all teenagers. You ought to be happy about that. Imagine you're all teenagers. Now think about this for a minute. If you're all teenagers and you're all going to this church, look around you and, and take out um, two, uh, two people for every ten. They're the only people left in the church by the time they reach their 20s. Two out of every ten kids will remain in the church when they get in their 20s. Now what's happening here is we're pouring our life into these kids, but we're not doing it effectively, we're not doing it well, and we need to focus on getting the Word of God to them, which means we need to be show the material. All of our teachers, everybody who works with youth, needs to get in the Bible and study and understand so that we can have something to offer our children. That's the challenge of the church. Now I want you to notice, secondly, the command and our opportunity. 
Um, I call it TNT tonight, and it's powerful. Listen to what the Bible says. Again, what Paul writes here. He says, The things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Number one, we need to train. Number two, we need to nurture. Number three, we need to transfer. We need to train, we need to nurture, we need to transfer. I want to look at these three things, and this is how we'll finish this message. Number one, we need to invest in the next generation. We need to train a new generation of Christian leaders. Now, it starts with you and with me. We are the ones that have been taught, we have been trained, it is not their responsibility. It's not our kids' responsibility. It's our responsibility. We are called. This is not pastor's responsibility. He's got a job to do in it, but it is not pastor's responsibility. It is not the deacon's responsibility, the trustee's responsibility. It is the responsibility of every single member of this church. It must begin with a solid, scriptural, and relevant Sunday school that deals head-on with the issues of today. That will deal with evolution and scientism and cultural rejection of absolutes. Our teachers need to be the best trained teachers around, and that's why you need bioma. Secondly, our children's ministry and our junior church must teach the scripture and must create a desire for the truth of God. And that means our workers have to be well trained and well equipped. Our teen ministry is the front line in a war for the soul of the generation of the next group of kids coming up. And we must aggressively demonstrate the difference between what they hear in school and what the Bible teaches. Our teen workers need to be soaked in the word of God and they need to know how to combat the thinking of the world. Our music ministry must rest on solid biblical principles because the music ministry is an adjunct to our pastor's preaching ministry. And we can't have them saying one thing with their songs and another thing with, with, their, um, with the message that we give. And therefore, every singer, every leader in our, uh, in our music ministry needs to be trained in the word of God. So that's train. Number two, nurture. Nurture. By nurture, I mean to cultivate. Now, my grandfather was a farmer. He knew how to cultivate things. And every believer needs to have his or her gifts cultivated. First of all, we must know who, what we are without Christ. That is, we need to understand that there is nothing good in us. We must under have a biblical understanding that there is not a spark of God in us. That we are wicked and sinful and we need a Savior. Secondly, we must know what we are in Christ. That is, we need to be grounded in positional truth. We need to understand what the Bible says about our salvation. Thirdly, we must know the word of truth for ourselves. And, and look, folks, I don't understand this. Why is it that you will, um, you will spend hours on the Internet looking up every symptom that you ever have anytime you get a cold or a flu or something like that and run down to professional when you think you're sick and all of that and you think you can just simply go through life spiritually and not worry about your spiritual symptoms. We as the people of God need to be constantly looking in the word of God. I don't want to rely on somebody else telling me I'm saved. I want to know in my heart that I am. And then we must know what the teaching of what the world is teaching us, what the, they're teaching our families and how to combat that. And that's what this next class that we're going to be doing 
um, at Bioma will be doing. Nurture. And finally, transfer. Transfer. We need to transfer our Christianity onto the next generation of young uh, believers. And let me say this to you today. Number one, we need to pass on our hymnody. I appreciate what Brother Brett does in this church because he takes and gives us these wonderful hymns of the faith. We need to understand what our hymns say. We need to know how to analyze a hymn. We need to understand the doctrinal content of a hymn and what hymns not to sing and what hymns to sing. And we are losing an entire generation. They put away the hymn books and now they've got a screen up there where they repeat some strange mantra that tells us nothing. And I will say this to you tonight. We need to pass on our hymnology. Number two, we need to pass on our theology. We need to not be Calvinist. We're not Reformed. We don't need to be Arminian. We are Biblicists, which means that we are dispensational, Bible-believing literalists, and we need to pass that on in our theology. That's why we use Chafer, systematic theology, here in the bio, uh, Bioma program, because it is the best. You will not get any better anywhere else. We need to pass on our theology. We must pass on our hermeneutic. Hermeneutic is the simple term that means how to interpret the Scripture. They, we need to teach people exactly what the Word of God has to say and how we know what it's saying, how to interpret the Bible. We need to pass on our ethics. That is, Pastor talked about in the first part of his uh, series on Ephesus, uh, on Ephesians, uh, uh, what we should believe. Then we're now in the part that tells us how we should behave. And that's what we need to know from the Bible. How should we behave? And then finally, we need to pass on our evangelism. If we don't win souls, let me tell you something. Pastor can't do it all. I can't do it all. Brother Greg can't do it all. We need you winning souls to Christ. And I want to ask you this question, just this revealing question. If this church depended on you to bring in the new people for this church, how much of that job have you done? I mean, just in every person should at least have impacted one person to bring one person into the church. Um, and we should do that every year. We should be bringing somebody into the church and somebody discipling in the church. And unless we do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Now, let me tell you one way we can do TNT, and that is through Bioma. This, by the way, is our new logo for Bioma. All to the glory of God, Bioma, the Bible Institute of the Macon area. What is our goal? Our goal is to train godly champions for Christ, to nurture their gifts and their knowledge, to transfer the hermeneutics, the theology, the hymnology, the ethics and evangelism from us to them. What is our method? We provide on-campus and off-campus courses on a Bible college level to those who are willing at a minimal cost. What is our dream? Our dream is to equip every one of our Sunday school teachers, our youth workers, our choir members, our staff with all they need to win the battle for hearts, minds, and souls. It's my Go, my belief that we could eventually use Bioma to reach out into our community. We can offer community literacy classes to bring people in and to teach them how to read using the Bible. Then secondly, we give them computer skills, which we are more than able to do. And then from there, um, I personally am a CPCU, which means that I can teach insurance licensing courses. We can help people get jobs at GEICO and other places. We have the opportunity, and all of that can be on a scriptural basis. Now, um, what can you do? This is, gets down to the, where the rubber meets the road. Um, number one, 
Uh, and let me just say what you can do. You can pass, P-A-S-S. -S. What can you do? Number one, P, you can pray. That's what we need more than anything. We need you to pray for the ministry of Bioma. Pray for its leaders. Pray for um, our, our curriculum. Pray that God will keep us doing the right thing. Number two, you can A, attend class. We're opening a class right now um, on Thursday uh, that will deal with cults, the occult, and world religions. And what we're going to do in this class is we're going to start out and we're going to teach you what the Bible says about the truth. And that will be worth going to the class just for that. Now when we give you a basis to understand what the truth is, we're going to compare. Look, I, I've heard people say all the time, some of you Baptists are so snooty and everything like that, you think you have the corner on the truth. We're just going to teach the truth, and then what we're going to do is we're going to lay the Roman Catholic Church up next to the truth. We're going to lay the Presbyterian Church up next to the truth. We're going to lay the um, uh, Seventh-day Adventists up next to the truth. We're going to lay the uh, Islamic faith up against next to the truth. We're going to lay the Jehovah's Witnesses up against next to the truth. We're going to lay militant atheism against the truth. We're going to put um, uh, the, the whole idea of evolution against the truth. We're going to look at all of these varied things and we're going to compare them with what the Bible actually says and then we're going to give you the ability to then take that knowledge and how can we best use that to win people to Christ. Thirdly then, you can support bioma. S stands for support. You can support us by number one, attending the classes. Number two, by giving uh, funds to that. Now, we don't charge anything for the courses. But there is expense involved. We, we do um, print out material and um, we are eventually hoping to set up our own website where we have just a bioma website. Uh, right now, we're under the auspices of the church. Uh, but eventually it's going to be so that um, it may be burdensome to the church, and we don't want to do that. Um, we'd also like to be able to uh, equip um, a, uh, a good library for people who are uh, wanting to learn the Word of God and bring these things in. There are so many things we can do, and of course we've got um, people all over the world that are using our material right now. So we want to be able to, to move forward, and that requires the, the help of you supporting us, standing with us, and being, and some of you have specific skills and gifts we could use you to teach in Bioma, and that would be a blessing to us. And then thirdly, and this is, uh, fourthly rather, this is really important, spread the word. Spread the word. Now, um, let me show you a couple of things that are available to you through Bioma. Um, and let me show you how you can spread the word. Right now, um, up on the screen there, you see the entire listing of all of the course material that we have put up on our church's website. There are um, several hundred, if not a few thousand, pages worth of material up on the church's website. That's all up there. It's all available. It's all free. You need to let other people know about that. Our church has a website that has a lot of free material on there. And if you want to read about the doctrine of the Trinity, if you want to read about sin, if you want to read about salvation, there's a place you can find lots of good stuff and it's all free. Also, we have a YouTube channel. And that YouTube channel has all of our revelation uh, things. Uh, eventually, I hope to get up all of the classes. Every class that we offer will eventually have a video of that class or at least an audio of that class up there on the web. And by the way, that takes time and that takes some ability and it takes some money to do that. So if you can help us with that, that would be a great blessing. But one thing you can do is to go to our YouTube page 
and our Facebook page, we have both of those, and click a like for those, because if you like those, and if you share them to your own pages, then um, the, uh, the internet... Um, the internet browsers will pick up that and will be able to drive more traffic to us. And that's really important. So if you, if you can help us out by going and liking our videos, liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, that is really important that you do that. It doesn't cost you any money, and all it would take is a little of your time to click that and to say, I support this ministry by liking it and by uh, being involved with it. So that's what you can do to support um, Bioma. Now let me just say, here's the class, Cults, World Religions, and the Occult Compared to the Truth of God's Word. It begins on Thursday night. The class textbook is written by Ken Ham, not our Ken Ham, but uh, Pastor uh, Brother Ken Ham up in the ark. His son-in-law, Bodie Hodge, and Roger Patterson, uh, another man that works for that ministry, um, wrote this book. It is a wonderful book. It is the first part of a three-part series that every Christian ought to have in their library. It, cost you, it will cost you $10 if you come to the class. Um, if you want the book, you just need to let me know you want the book, and I'll order the book for you. If you're on Kindle, you can get it for $5.99, on Amazon and other places like that that use Kindle. Uh, but that, that's available to you too. But I, I suggest very strongly that you read these lessons. What we'll do is we'll take the Word of God, we'll set it up, we'll take the, the, um, uh, we'll take the Word of God on one side and we'll take the, um, uh, the, uh, the error that's being taught by these other groups and we're just going to compare them. No, there's not going to be any condemnation. It is not a negative thing at all. All we're doing is just comparing them and if they come up short, it's not the fault of the Bible. And then we're going to tell you how you can in love try and reach these people and what's the best effective method to reach them. Now, what will it cost you to go to Bioma class? It costs you an hour of your time every week. What are the possible benefits? The possible benefits is that you can um, help your children, help your grandchildren, help your nieces, nephews, other people in this church so that they will be able to understand what kind of world they're living in today. We're living in a world that is full of trouble, full of grief, full of sorrow, but we have the answer. It's right here. It's called the Word of God. And I encourage you, I beg you, I plead with you, would you please consider attending Bioma and supporting Bioma in the coming days. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you.